Lots of you are busy getting your homes ready for Christmas, but some children will spend it in hospital. Kilin met a group of carpenters who are hoping to make the day extra special for them. This training workshop for apprentice joiners and carpenters has been transformed into Santa's Grotto. On top of their usual work, they have been handmaking hundreds of wooden toys which will be delivered to children around Ireland and the UK. Every year for almost 60 years, the apprentices at the John G. Sisk Training Centre have been given a very special project to work on. It is an initiative instigated by John G. Sisk himself and it has grown into one of the highlights of the year, not just for the hospitals or organisations looking after the children that receive these lovely wooden toys, but also for the Sisk team members involved. To start your pension about doing something like this is just so unique and so different. Handing out the toys is just it's immeasurable, just the, the feedback, the positivity, the smiles on the, on the ch- sick children and people in need, it's so positive and, and the vibes are really excellent. We just, it, it's incredible. Over the last uh, five, six weeks we've been just uh, in every day cutting different pieces of wood, sanding them, edge sealing them and then they go into the spray shop, they get sprayed. And when they're finally finished being sprayed, uh, we get to put them all together. So as you see behind me, uh, we've got some kitchen units, some work... That was David Tracy, Uh, former manager of the training centre, and Sally Jean Doherty, apprentice at the centre, speaking on an RTE News report about the annual CISC Christmas Toy Project, an initiative that has such a positive impact on the children, the organisations and institutions, and on the CISC team members who are involved in it. From the earliest days of Sisk in the late 1800s, when the original John Sisk replaced slum dwellings in Cork City with modern comfortable housing for his workers, making a positive impact on people and society has been a core part of the company's mission. And it is the focus of this episode of Inside Sisk. Welcome to Inside Sisk, a podcast series brought to you by John Sisk and Son, where we meet the people behind the projects. I'm your host, Patrick Hawhey, and on this episode, I meet some of the people who are driving forward programs and initiatives designed to positively impact the communities in which CISC operates, the families that the company builds homes for, and the team members within CISC itself. We will be talking about running construction sites in new and innovative ways, engaging with community groups and local charities, and hiring people from many different kinds of backgrounds and managing everyone with empathy and understanding. But first, we will go back and hear more about one of those initiatives that CISC is probably best known for, the annual Christmas Toy Project. When I visited the training centre, it was something that I chatted about with Ronan Murphy, the centre's current manager. There's a huge history of that. That started when we had a a state-of-the-art joinery here on, on this site, um, which was built in around the early 60s um, and around that time they started to build and make toys around Christmas time as a way of giving back and again John G. sister, the founder of that uh, was hugely about that of giving back something to society uh, and in particular orphans, hospitals, sick kids you know, was the focus uh, when you're doing something like that obviously word spreads a bit although it was never propagated from CISC. It was never advertised of, look what we do, because it was never about that. As you can imagine, there's a huge amount of manpower and material goes into these things. It's not, it's no small expense, but it was never that. It was about, the, it's a strange feeling giving something like that to kids and seeing the reaction, and seeing the reaction of the young lads when they go to deliver them, and we send them out to Crumla Hospital or down the country and that, to say that I've made this and given it to some kid and just uh, the way they light up is, is unbelievable. So the apprentices here are will be set a task. Um, do they have a certain amount of toys to make? Do they have certain kinds of toys to make? How does it work? Uh, you can imagine they're all solid wood toys with thousands, if not tens of thousands of parts to be cut, prepared, machined, sanded, painted, stickers applied, assembled. So it, it really is like Santa's workshop down there, and they are the elves. Uh, the the volume of stuff that's that's produced in a few short weeks is is huge. So it wouldn't be any one guy left on something. Or we will find that someone is better at assembly. Another guy is better at putting on stickers. He puts them on straight and whatever. 
So everyone flies in our little place and it's an amazing atmosphere here uh, during that time. Everyone is wrecked because they're working longer than normal. It's full on and there's deliveries to be met to get them out on time. But it is one of the miracles of Christmas that every year the lads seem to be able to do it. The effect that that has on on both ends to see lads going out who have made these toys and put them together themselves, stick a Santa hat on them and they go out and deliver them. Uh, the effect on the kids, effect on the staff in the hospital as well, but also the effects on the young lads to realise that all the efforts they've put in over a number of weeks to see that come to fruition and, and what it does for the kids. It's, uh, it is great. It is interesting to hear Ronan describe the impact that this initiative has had on the young apprentices involved in it. We will come back to him in a little while to talk about the apprenticeship programme in general and the impact that it can have on communities, schools and families. But now let's meet our next guest on this episode to talk about some of the other ways in which a company like CISC can make an impact. Hi, I'm uh, Raluca Ursu. I'm a technical coordinator for John Sisk and uh, also responsible for coordinating the community engagement plan for our projects in Wembley Park. So uh, Sisk has been in Wembley Park for the last 16 years working with Quintain, our client. So we have become familiar with the local borough brand and developed a successful relationship uh, with our client, but also with, uh, with the local community. And during this time, we've delivered over 2,000 apartments, uh, student accommodation units, uh, 161 bedroom uh, Hilton Hotel, uh, 1,000 spaces car park, a designer outlet. So we have been around Wembley for quite a lot. And our two most recent projects are Canada Gardens and the Robinson, which I have worked on. And they are part of a Wembley Park regeneration scheme and comprise of 1,200 apartments, a car park and coach park, an energy center, as well as community employment and uh, outdoor spaces. So, Raluca, what is community engagement and why is it important? Well, I think to understand it as a concept i think by its nature by its nature construction is perceived as being a disruptive project with effects on the local community however i i strongly believe that if it's handled correctly uh not only you can minimize the impact but you can actually engage with the local community and you can make a positive impact that lasts long after we have left the site and I do believe that the industry as a whole uh, did come a long way when it comes to minimizing the impact. We have now logistics plan in place. We have booking systems to prevent like any road disruptions caused by deliveries. We adhere to strict working times. We have CCTV systems in place, strict rules on operatives' behavior. Also, things like dust monitors, other measures to prevent noise, vibration pollution, uh, regular road sweepers even to maintain like a clean site perimeter. And people from the local area have a say and they can contact us on the phone number that's actually displayed on the hoarding if they have like any issues and complaints and we just make sure we record them and action them. So we are trying to keep relationship with our community and be open to like any questions, suggestions or whatever yeah. they want to yeah, find out or because I, I think even even something as simple as having a phone number on a hoarding um, it makes a big, big difference because I think hoardings by their nature can feel like a barrier between community and company, you know, and when you've actually, it's you open it up a little bit that way. Yeah, and we also have on all our projects, we have like a community notice board where you also have like an email address they can contact us, where we have like progress uh, photos so they can see where we are with our projects like what events we we're hosting like within the community and just we just update that so they are up to date with our site progress okay so that's that's p part one where you try and minimize impact but then you mentioned part two where you can actually have a positive impact on the community um, beyond part one so tell us a bit about that yes yeah, so as a company uh we are 
very mindful of our role in community. And uh, I personally am very proud of our uh, corporate social responsibility stats at Wembley, which are only proof of the effort uh, put in by the whole team from the client to the project team and to the supply chain. And just to give a quick overview, um, over the duration of these two projects, we have donated over 150k to local charities. We have volunteered over 360 person hours. And throughout the project, we have had over 46 visits from schools and universities. We have been in partnership with two local schools. Um, also, another thing that's really important to us is to hire locally as much as we can, which is a big focus. And approximately 40% of our labor came from the local area. Um, also, we have employed 35 apprentices, so we're very keen on supporting young people coming into the industry. And out of our 35 apprentices, 21 were, again, coming from the local area. And just to mention a few of uh, our initiatives, um, we have had a school engagement program uh, where the local children uh, visited the site every six months to see the development, to meet the team, to take part in different construction challenges. And the visits aimed uh, to help local kids just understand and appreciate the importance of a, a community to be part of the development and just see how, how the project evolves. But I think one of the most uh, important achievements that we had at Wembley is uh, our partnership with Sufra, which is a local food bank. Yeah, well, tell us tell us about that. So you've so you've outlined an awful lot of different things that are really interesting. But I know this is this is the project you felt was one of the the more significant. What is Sufra, and and how did you get involved, and what did that involvement look like? Uh, Sufra is a local food bank that provides free meals and welfare assistance, basically for for people in need. They are building St. Raphael's Estate in Stonebridge, which is one of the most deprived neighborhoods in Brent. And as a result, the community engagement there was minimal and the charity needed all the support to carry on the activities. Um, first time we approached Sufra was during one of our previous projects at Wembley Park, uh, Emerald Gardens, and we just got in contact to donate Christmas toys made by our carpentry apprentices in Ireland. And after visiting them and seeing the poor conditions at their premises, we wanted to offer further help to encourage and support all they have been doing for the local community. And we went there and wanted to survey the premises and we realized that the extent of um, this repair was uh, was more than we had initially planned for. And a small project quickly turned into like the complete refurbishment of um, the premises and we got the supply chain involved. We like stripped out exist existing internal ceilings, partitions. We completely rewired the facility, installed new walls, ceilings, electrical fittings, so that we could provide them with new professional ca uh, catering facilities and uh, amenity spaces. And this improvement enabled Sufra to provide emergency food aid to considerably more people and created the basically a community hub that's open seven days a week, uh, serving the, the needs of the resident. Um, also, like every year at Christmas, we have donated handmade uh, wooden toys, made our carpentry apprentices, funded their Christmas dinners for members of the community in need. Uh, and we, we have been doing that for the past few years, and we're just willing to continue helping them really in any way that we can. One of the things that Raluca mentioned there about the project at Wembley was the focus on employing apprentices and supporting young people coming into the industry in that way. And this also really feeds into the impact that a company like CISC can have on the schools and the families from which these young apprentices come. So let's go back to Ronan Murphy, manager of the John G. CISC Training Centre, to hear a little bit more about how that can work. What kind of backgrounds do the apprentices come from? Or is it incredibly varied? Oh, hugely. All right across society. And it's one of the beauties of this is we, we don't know what we're going to get. They are all walks of life. And some of them will be 
uh, you know, you'll spot it in the interview where they'll come in and they'll be maybe they'll be dressed like an interview for the bank, which is great. It's good to see someone turned out. Um, but equally, you'll see a guy who's just smartly dressed um, from a different background, obviously. But equally, it's all about why am I here? Why am I sitting in front of you uh, wanting to be a carpenter? And sometimes it will happen, of course. You get why are you here? Well, my mother said I should turn up. <laughs> you know, and that's they're a battle to begin with. Um, yeah. And you feel a little sorry for them that, you know, they haven't found their spot. And usually that comes out in the first couple of minutes. So normally the, the interview will take a slightly different course. There's no point in embarrassing them, if you like, asking them to do the, the measurement test or this test. So uh, I'll probably take them to, you know, this is a hard uh, apprenticeship we have hundreds of applicants and just try and bring them down a little. Uh, I hope you're, you might be lucky, you know, you might get through. But come along and maybe do a bit of work experience with us or try going at some other thing. So there's lots of ways of letting people down um, when you know that they're not going to make it. Do you, um, would you ever um, work with people you know would be from difficult backgrounds and uh, may need a certain type of guidance? that maybe some others don't. Yeah, I suppose uh, we're not always aware of someone's background initially, but one of the traits, I suppose, that any manager needs, uh, to my mind, you're nine-tenths a, a social worker, I say, you know, you're... And uh, with time, you tease out these things, you know, you realise a guy is late every second Tuesday and there's something going on there and he's, he's running out the gate on a Thursday. And with a bit of conversation and coming around to that, you, you find out the little bits to make a fella tick that, yeah, he's to pick up his sister from his second mother uh, on a Thursday. And this sort of stuff comes out. Um, and then, I, you know, we're, while it's, it is a job, apprenticeship is very much, you're getting paid from the day you start. Um, they are young lads and young people and you take that into consideration a little because we're, we're moulding them in the four years that we have them. Um, and yeah it pays you back when you're open yeah. to that sort of thing and particularly at, at that age for all of us one of the the most positive things that can happen to you is that you feel you're doing something with purpose and that makes you feel good like you're good at something it, it must be interesting to watch that come to life uh, very much and I suppose I'm uh, I'm not hugely long doing this although I'm a long time a manager I was 30 odd years on site and it's very much about the people always about the people um, and uh, yes you're right the most rewarding are when you you see someone who's struggling badly and you're able to help them by saying well I've noticed you're you don't like to be here on a Wednesday what can we do about that can you work on a bit on Tuesday what you know maybe can you do a half day Wednesday maybe you'll come in on Saturday morning and we'll make it all you know uh, when you open yourself in two ways like when someone sees that you're observant of the pain that they're going through in and by pain I mean difficulties and of all sorts uh, it comes back to you in volumes like to go out of your way to be helpful uh, as just human nature that someone is being kind to me I'll return it and that's in, in every walk and, and I take that into how I deal with these lads they're no different they're just younger they're, they're easier to mould sometimes because of that um, they're more impressionable you know but equally, you can grab their attention better because, you know, I'm going to some, give you something in my 50 odd years experience. Listen. You yeah. Know. Yeah. And it, 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 it comes down as well to something that, you know, we, we hear about, which is social impact and being able to sort of have an impact on, you know, the community around you uh, and the impact of society. Because if you can, you know, uh, make one person good at what they do and feel good about themselves then that has a ripple effect Oh very much yeah absolutely and, and I suppose seeing repeat there are certain schools where we keep getting repeat guys coming back where they've gone back to their old school uh, and, and say well here's where I am now five years on whatever um, but I suppose the the impact can go on in families as well we have had brothers and cousins and all coming from the same family group if you like our extended family group and it is great to see that that's a you know you're definitely making a, a difference but we offer something unique here in Sisk in that we're able to show them a future of 
not just your your carpenter after your four years, the right sort of person goes on, can be a supervisor, can go on to be a site manager, can go on and so the progression that we can offer to, to lads that are with us is is immense. Uh, some of them grasp it early on and see that oh, I, that's for me or I'm, or it's not for me, um, and we're always looking out for those candidates as we go along, and we've been lucky over the years we've got so many uh, most of our senior managers out there at the moment are came through the train centre it is it's something unique about carpentry and joinery as well it's something about the process that forms in your mind when maybe it's the elemental part where I have to bring these parts together to create something whole that works on the bigger building scale where you're at you have great empathy with the other trades uh, a tradesman needs his space let him do his piece of work then this guy can work, then the next guy can work. And it's that understanding of how those bits go together. I think that's what makes great site manager. So we have looked at positive social impact in a number of different ways now. Giving handmade gifts to children, lowering the impact of construction sites on the locality, supporting local communities and charities, and employing people from a variety of backgrounds and managing them in a way that allows them to do their best work and to grow in confidence. But what about the impact that construction projects can have on the people that actually get to work or live in them or visit them for whatever purpose that they were designed for? This can, in some way, deliver the most positive impact on the most amount of people. And this came up in my conversation with Fergal Lawler recently, Managing Director of Cisk Living, the part of the group that builds homes for people, many of these homes, social and affordable homes for families who really need them. Building a home for anybody is a, a very satisfying, fulfilling thing to do. Is it even more fulfilling and satisfying to create homes for people who arguably really, really need them, the type of people who you would be building for? There is indeed, and I think it, it can be that uh, we, we, we're developing projects now which we refer to as tenure blind. And I suppose by tenure, uh, I would mean social, affordable, uh, private and, and, and rental uh, properties. And um, to that end, you're building houses is, is the same. But what I invite our team to think about is think about that family who are turning the key in the house that we have just built for them and in many ways the journey that that family or individuals have gone to get to that point has probably endured hardships that hopefully none of us ever have to um, experience and if you think about the, the smile the smile uh, on their on their face and the sense of arrival uh, for them and we've had the benefit of, of actually seeing that uh, firsthand on the Social Housing Bundle 1 PPPs, um, where Cis Living uh, delivered four of the of the sites, uh, predominantly all, uh, all houses. And uh, we're also uh, a party uh, to the uh, tenant management and the services of those uh, houses for 25 years. So... Uh, as a stakeholder within that we very much can can see that transition from just uh, walking off site having reached practical completion uh, to their ar- arrival and and indeed uh, their hopefully their enjoyment of their homes uh, for 25 years and can you describe any anything families you've seen or you know people you've come across or any any stories and experiences and indeed, there are some um uh, some of the very stakeholders have have put up uh, youtube videos of, of of some of those and um i suppose a number of the the comments are the the high quality of the play areas the basketball uh, pitches um uh, running tracks in in one of the schemes in dunlear um, and how that actually helps the, the the families in terms of the children being able to safely, uh, with passive supervision, uh, to be able to enjoy their homes, uh, and also they all remark about the quality of the homes and the finishes of the of the kitchens. Uh, and bear in mind again how the journey that many people um, and how long they've been on on housing lists, etc., um, and perhaps living in hotels. Uh, that sense of their own space and 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 a high quality uh, finish because these uh, the, the 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 houses and the homes that we are are building are, are built to the to the highest standards um, and in terms of of heating efficiency and energy efficiency um, 
you know, every, everything is, 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 is top notch, really. I think it's very important when you first start a project just to do a bit of research, try and get to know the area, perhaps just get involved in local events where possible and just get to know people from the local area, uh, being it just young people looking for a job or a career in construction or just regular members of the community. Uh, Every area is different, so there isn't like a formula, but it is important to get to know the place and find out about what schools are local, what charities are local and based nearby, and just see what potential for creating a community engagement plan is. But what I do believe it's most important is to try and get the whole team engaged if possible and just encourage everyone to get involved and share their ideas. And I think that's why it worked so well in Wembley it, because it really has been a shared effort and it was only possible just with contributions from the whole project team, the client and the supply chain. To be honest, I've been doing it since I've joined CISC and I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's really a part of my job that I, I enjoy and it does give me, it's, it's, it's very rewarding, I think. So um, yeah, it's just uh, something that I will carry on looking for, I believe, <laughs> for quite some time. Our thanks to Reluca Ursu, Ronan Murphy and Fergal Lawler for taking part in this episode of Inside CISC and giving us a picture of how a company like CISC can have a strong, positive impact on the society in which it operates and the many different ways that that can be achieved. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. Please follow the series on Spotify and subscribe on Apple Podcasts and do leave a rating or review. I hope you can join us for the next episode of Inside CISC. Inside CISC.